Hey, you look like someone who's concerned about what's in their water. <laughs> yes, you. But do you know what's in your water filter? Well, inside a normal water filter, like you'd get in something like a Brita that you'd attach to your tap or something like that, it is uh, filled with, among other things, carbon, so-called activated carbon. And this carbon kind of looks like crushed up coal, but it's just tiny pieces of carbon. <laughs> Now, why they use carbon particles like this is because in the crushed up form, these little particles have so many microscopic and even nanoscopic holes and indentations and little nooks and crevices that they have an immense amount of surface area. It's kind of like the difference between a cube of sugar, which just has a cube's worth of surface area, and granulated sugar in the tiny, tiny grains. The same uh, amount of sugar will have a lot more surface area when it's crushed up into those little grains. So similarly, activated carbon has an absurd surface area. For example, this uh, marker has a surface area of... Oh, old TI never fails me. About 0 .007 square meters. Now, if I had the same amount of activated carbon that this weighs, the same thing as this, it wouldn't be 0 .007 square meters, it would be 40 acres. Activated carbon, as much as could fit inside the volume of this marker, would have 40 acres of surface area. That's 0.1 square kilometers. And with that much surface area, that's what traps all the little particles and uh, little microscopic organisms and stuff, the stuff that you do not want inside of your water. Britta! Our filters have so much activated carbon in it, it'll give you the surface area of seven and a half thousand human skins. Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I take all your comments, questions, and corrections and address them with little props, maybe a calculator or two, maybe a ruler. Who knows? And then I tell you what's coming up next week on this channel. Hint. It's about moving through a material with a similarly high surface area. Ooh. But getting right down to it, in the last episode of Because Science, we are trying to figure out how Captain Marvel survives the vacuum of space unprotected. Canonically, Carol Danvers can survive in space without a suit over her face, without a helmet, without anything pressurized. I said that maybe if her Cree genetics altered her in such a way that she could have a larger spleen and superhumanly strong valves to give her her own little portable atmosphere inside of her body and her DNA could be more resistant to damage from radiation like tar Tardigrades are resistant to radiation damage, then she could approach a humanoid that is more void ready. But what did you have to say that was an intelligent comment about the episode and not about the movie? Frequent commenter, Lord of the Keyboard, he who shall not be typed. Uh, says, uh, I've been a huge fan of space ever since the fourth grade and had a whole list of corrections I plan to make, but I can't because science is so incredibly thorough. <laughs> but Lord of the Keyboard goes on to say that because it is so hard to lose heat in space, Carol Danvers or Captain Marvel in her binary form would have a lot of trouble losing heat while she is in space using her powers because as we said, she's on fire. Lord of the Keyboard goes on to say that she would need some kind of uh, radiator system like the International Space Station has to lose all of that heat more effectively. If you've ever seen the International Space Station, I think you probably have, it has those large panels on either side of it that kind of make it look like an orbiting satellite. But those are just radiators that efficiently throw heat from human bodies and electrical systems into space. So Captain Marvel would need something like that, right? Well, Lord of the Keyboard, I agree with you. Losing heat in space is very, very hard, and so she would need some kind of radiation system. However, because her powers are photon-based, or light-based, if you will, the photons that she could be throwing out with her binary powers could be in the infrared portion of the spectrum. She could be flinging off heat radiation from her body so her powers could act as their own radiators. That would be very interesting. And it makes me think of another thing. You know why good thermoses are really, really good? That's the plural of thermos. It's because they have a vacuum seal in between two layers of metal. That means there's no air in between, just like there's no air in space. And so heat transfer happens very, very slowly into and out of a really good thermos like this, which is why it's, again, hard to lose heat in space, uh, which is also why 
I put ice cubes in this thermos in water at 8 a.m. You hear that? You hear that? That's ice cubes. Oh, that was open. Alias says space exposure under realistic conditions would instantly freeze you, sort of. If you're in a spaceship surrounded by air at room temperature in one atmosphere and the room you're in is suddenly exposed to space, the air's pressure suddenly drops to near zero and the volume goes to practically infinity, so as a result, temperature goes to zero. You're technically getting frozen as the air is rushing past you through the breach. Unless you had a force shield that blocked gases but allowed solid objects to pass through, any realistic instant space exposure is going to have that problem. I disagree. Like we, like we said in the episode, uh, if you are instantly exposed to space uh, and, you're, and there's air wherever you are, that air is, as you say, alias, uh, correctly going to expand out to infinity and this will cause a adiabatic cooling effect. So there's no real heat transfer, it just gets really cold if that makes sense. So the moisture in your mouth, on your eyes, on your skin, if it's there, they, it will immediately boil away and it'll become very cold and it'll get the frost and stuff on your body. But like we were just saying, with a really nice thermos or with uh, radiators in space, it's so hard to lose heat in space that I've seen estimates that if a human body was dead, recently dead, thrown out an airlock into space, it might take up to 24 hours for that body to fully freeze through. Even though space is one of the coldest places that we know of, it would still take a human body very, very long to freeze all the way through. The layers of your skin, uh, your eyeballs, your tongue, sure. But your entire body down to the core, mm-hmm. Ian Ogendi says, random question, if you wanted to boil water at an altitude below zero, below sea level, does the temperature increase as well because the ambient pressure is higher? We used the example of raising a cup of water up on top of a mountain in the episode, and I said because the ambient pressure is lower, it would take less heat energy uh, put into the water to boil it, and this is true in reverse. Let's say you were some sea-dwelling creature, some Atlantean, if you will, and because of the way gas exchange works in your body and how you build your homes underwater, let's just say that they are pressurized against the uh, sea pressure pushing down on you, pushing down on them, no man has for it at like three atmospheres or something like that. Then the temperature to boil water inside your home dome <laughs> will no longer be 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. It could be 50 or 100 degrees more than that. That's how much the boiling point would increase for water if you're trying to cook a sick pasta dinner underneath the sea. <laughs> Which sounds like some kind of Disney movie something. No? Anyway, yes, you're correct. It also works the other way. If you go below sea level, it's harder to boil water and make your sweet past. But the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to one time super nerd and now two time whoo, super nerd Love Hawks, who says, part of Carol Danvers' survivability may be in our face all along, or more accurately, on her face in some of the trailer scenes. Uh, she and the Kree have blue blood. This suggests that they have a hemocyanin based blood or some combination of hemocyanin and hemoglobin. Along with having a resistance to certain pathogens, hemocyanin blood is more efficient in cold and low O2 environments. While the vacuum of space may be a bit of a stretch for the capabilities of blue blood, it would fare much better than the red stuff in the rest of us. What this also means is that in addition to a super Cree spleen, misspelled, any blood rich organ could in fact be an oxygen reservoir compared to their hemoglobin filled counterparts. What an astute observation, Love Hawks. I didn't even think about that. Uh, look at this red rock crab. <laughs> It's got purple and bluish blood, and they have hemocyanin in their blood, and I checked, and you're right, because I didn't know this off the top of my head, that blood is more efficient and transporting oxygen around the body when the temperatures are low and the oxygen pressure, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, is very low. So having something like this mechanism going on is kind of plausible for a low O2, low pressure environment like space. So you, Love Hawks, are a two-time super nerd. Ah! But of course, I'm not always right, and as we're speaking of blood right now, I just want to make a little, uh, a quick, quick comment 
about an episode of the science of Mortal Kombat that we just released. I hope you're enjoying the series. It was a lot of fun to make, and it looks great, if I do say so myself. But in the last episode that we released, we were talking about blood projectiles, and many of you made me feel so good took issue with me not freezing blood and using it as a projectile. Let me just quickly give you my reasoning for this. And Alan's, it's not all my fault. One, we are approximating magic. Two, the blood that Scarlet uses in Mortal Kombat 11 isn't frozen, so we would have to justify that. Three, it is impossible to push fluid into a surface like a body with a constant force without that uh, fluid deforming, which is why we used a casing around it. And four, an ice spike and a blood spike would have the same mass. And mass is very important for projectiles, so I think that justifies our conclusion for why we didn't just freeze pig's blood. And also, ew. But going back to Captain Marvel for a second, what did I get wrong this week? <laughs> I really, I really hope he wasn't trying to spell adrenaline. But adrenaline, dude, says, I get your point, but how about we make a simpler approach and just say that cosmic energy that surrounds Captain Marvel forms a kind of barrier against space, like you talked about in your other video when Aquaman was passing under the water. You were also talking about cavitation to move through the water more easily. Maybe she could have some kind of vacuum cavitation? Oh, also, love the show. Hope to be as smart as you someday. Look, 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 look. We're all learning this together. Trust me. Consider me your guide through the world of... the world. I don't think your comment is rubbish, Adrenaline Dude, or may I call you Epinephrine. In fact, I like it quite a lot. I think it's, I think it's fine to say that Captain Marvel's binary powers could be in encircling her and creating some kind of pressurized environment so she can take around a portable atmosphere and so she can be fine in space. I just wanted to take the more biological approach so that we can come up with some kind of way to change a humanoid that would be more realistic or more close to doable through the changing of genetics and DNA and that kind of thing. Oh, and to be clear, you wouldn't need any kind of vacuum cavitation in space because there is no real medium to move through in space that would be putting significant drag forces on you when you're going at non-relativistic velocities. Once you get up into a good percentage of the speed of light, you are hitting interstellar gas and dust so quickly that it does put some drag on you, but it's more or less negligible if you're moving at Aquaman th speeds through space, which is a weird sentence to say. But Aquaman needs it because water is a lot thicker than space. You can take my word on that. Scott Willis has a correction and says, with all the changes mentioned, it should be possible for her to withstand space for a brief period of time. He then goes on to do some calculations, assuming 100% oxygen transfer efficiency and uh, holding air inside of Captain Marvel's lungs, etc., and says she could have reserve oxygen for just over six minutes. What we're not told is if Creed genetics can enhance her anaerobic, without oxygen, processes so oxygen isn't required, or if it even allows her to convert CO2 directly to oxygen through something like photosynthesis. Now, I like your approach here, Scott, because what we were trying to do is not ensure indefinite space exposure with everything that we are saying that could change biologically and genetically, morphologically, etc. None of that would allow Captain Marvel to stay in space for extended, extended periods of time, like days or years or an entire life. Um, so you're right, something about her would have to change even more so that she can get the resources her body will eventually need. Even if she slows her metabolism way, way, way down, she will eventually need food and water and oxygen. So there needs to be some kind of way around that. And I... Infinite Asim, frequent commenter, says, nitpicking! You said Crees. The plural of Cree is still just Cree, kind of like one sheep and many sheep. Sorry, I just had to do that. Great job in the episode, though. Hey, thank you. Fine. Plural of Cree is still Cree. Maybe we could call them, let's come up with a group name for Cree. How about an accusal of Cree? I like saying sheeps better. Justice C says, you said there are no cosmophiles, as I put it. Tardigrades can survive in space. 
Mm, okay, so let me be more clear. I tried to make this clear in the episode. But as far as we know, there are no organisms that live, thrive, and reproduce in space as their main habitat. Tardigrades can survive exposure to vacuum for many days at a time, but they are not living there. They are enduring space-like conditions. When they go into space, they revert into a state that's called a ton, a T-U-N. They slow their metabolism way down. They lose most of their water. They draw in all their little peats into their little, a little chunky body, <laughs> and they go into like a state of suspended animation. It's not exactly living. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I'm giving to Alexander Rogers, who says there is still a problem about moving in space. If Captain Marvel is using photons for propulsion, using her photon blast like we see in the film, then we can do some interesting physics. Using gravitational potential energy of Earth and the mass of Brie Larson, it would take about 200 million joules in the form of photons to get into LEO, or low Earth orbit. This would need a photon production of, oh, five, Oh, 50,000 trillion trillion yellow photons per second. That's a lot. Yes, if Captain Marvel is using photons for propulsion from her feet and her hands, kind of like Iron Man, but with light, which sounds really cool, then she would need a substantial power output. We've considered making rockets that use photons of light for propulsion before. The most popular, I think, is called the nuclear photonic rocket. It uses a nuclear energy source to get so hot that the photons of light and the infrared spectrum that it's throwing out the back of it produces enough thrust to create a kind of spacecraft. But the amount of of energy, the amount of radiation you have to throw out into space in the form of photons of light is so great that the efficiency isn't that good. You need megawatts and megawatts and megawatts of power just for a few newtons of thrust. So if Captain Marvel is truly using photons from her hands and her feet for thrust, then she needs a star level kind of output, which thankfully, with binary powers, she has. So it kind of makes sense. So. I use make sense pretty loosely here, but I do not use super nerd loosely. Alexander, you are this. Oh, he said, oh, I will get on footnotes one day. You did it. You done did it. And now on to this week in geekery. The next episode of Because Science is how do dunes giant sandworms swim? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, we are working with a professor of physics from the Georgia Institute of Technology, which I'm very excited about, to figure out just how a giant sandworm, famous from the Dune series of novels, would actually move through sand. How should they look? How should they locomote? How should they behave? We go through all of this in a episode that's not quite as dense as the novel and not as good looking as the movie, but my name's Kyle, and so is the main character in the film, so we're close. Don't have his eyebrows, though. Little bit thicker than mine. <laughs> McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Glocky. Let's see him do that. That's right. I'm challenging Kyle McLaughlin to a brow off. <laughs> So, go watch the latest episode of Because Science, all about Captain Marvel and how she survives the vacuum of space unaided. If you haven't yet, leave me all your best comments, corrections, and questions at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and the tweeters. Oh, and don't forget, there may be no I in team, but there is a I get a ton in a contingent. <laughs>